The Mystery of Room 16 by Anne Austin The city editor called me to his desk as he hung up the receiver. Chase over to the Alexandria Hotel. Jenks has just phoned from police headquarters that a young chap named of Anson, Jerry Anson, died of cyanide poisoning in front of an elevator a few minutes ago. Jenks will cover the police angle, but there seems to be a woman connected to the case. She's disappeared, he says, and I'd like a woman's angle on the whole thing. House Detective Flournoy is a friend of ours. He'll give you the dope as he works on the case. As the city editor talked, he did not look up, but continued to run through copy and clippings on his desk. It was that hectic hour, two o'clock, and ours was an afternoon sheet. I would have to move fast if I got anything into the final edition. A murder or a suicide in the fashionable and high-priced Alexandria Hotel was something of a sensation in itself. The same event occurring in a small hostelry on Hill Street or Main Street would have been looked upon as nothing out of the ordinary and would hardly have called for the services of a woman feature writer, at least in the early stages of its investigation. I found Flournoy, who was paid to keep notoriety away from the sacred portals of the Alexandria, in a state of profound excitement. The guests were of two minds. They enjoyed the sensation, but pretended a slight feeling of resentment that this thing should have happened where they were stopping. "'Funny business,' said Flournoy, as we stood at the door of Room 16, where the suicide or murder victim had played his last earthly drama. "'Ordinarily I would set it down as suicide,' but there are aspects of this case that lead me to believe it is murder. It was one of the Alexandria's more modest rooms, fairly large and well furnished. On one of the twin beds, both of them had been slightly mussed, as by people lounging on them after the chambermaid had done her best, lay the body of a young man. I was fortunate in arriving just when I did, for the body was just about to be removed to the morgue as I entered. The room was nearly full of people, whom the police were having a hard time to control. Any person who touches anything in this room without authority will be immediately placed under arrest, a broad-breasted man in plain clothes was saying when I entered. A group of reporters, policemen, and hotel employees was gathered about a folding table, such as is used for serving meals in guests' rooms. The table had been set for two, and evidently two people had eaten a very good luncheon. On the white cloth were scattered the usual silver, plates, cups, and saucers, the silver cover of a meat dish, a water bottle, and two glasses, both of which had been partially emptied. The meal had been so recently finished that the water in the glasses did not look stale. There were no small bubbles collected against the sides of the glasses. I had a good look at the face of the boy before his body was removed. He was very young, not more than twenty-two or three, fair-haired, blue-eyed, and thin-cheeked. His rather full mouth was slightly distorted, as if in a death agony. The chin had a deep cleft, which gave the whole face a very childish and pathetic appeal. When the two white-coated attendants from the morgue had withdrawn with the stretcher on which the body lay covered, the sergeant turned to survey the room full of people. Two men from police headquarters stood at his elbow. "'Is the day clerk in the room?' he asked. "'Yes, sir. Tell all you know about the deceased.' "'Well, it's not much.' The day clerk, enjoying the spotlight, smiled deprecatingly. "'The young man came in this morning about ten o'clock and registered for himself and wife. Mr. and Mrs. Jerry Anson, Oakland, California. He had a large, handsome suitcase with him, and I did not ask him for his room rent in advance.' Said he and his wife would be here several days. He was here on business. Also said his wife was out shopping and would come in later in the morning. He told me he would like to have luncheon served in his room later, and I told him he could telephone for a waiter when he wanted one. I saw him buy a paper and a magazine at the newsstand, and then he followed the bellboy up to his room. Did you see him again? Yes. He came down in an hour or so, about eleven o'clock and left his key at the desk. I asked him if he found everything all right, and he said everything was fine. He said if his wife came in and asked for the key, 
for me to tell her that he would be out only a few minutes. She didn't come, and he seemed a little disturbed. He said to me, jokingly, I suppose I'll have to put a mortgage on the old homestead to pay for all the shopping she's doing. I made some polite remark, and he walked away. I never saw him again, until the waiter, Carney, came running up to the desk to tell me that he was dead. He said, Never mind that. We'll let Carney tell his own story. When did Mrs. Anson arrive? She didn't arrive at all, so far as I know. I never left the desk, and no lady came to ask the number of Mr. Anson's room. She may have... Let's not speculate on what she may have done, the sergeant said sharply. Is the telephone operator in the room? Yes, sir, said a girl's voice. I was on the board from ten o'clock to one when I was relieved so I could eat. Your name? Miss Parsons, sir. The girl flung back her head defiantly, her childhood fear of the police strong upon her. Did you put through any telephone calls for Mr. Anson, either incoming or outgoing? Only one. He called for a waiter, and I connected him with the restaurant. He didn't call any outside number, and no one called him. Is the waiter here? the sergeant called peremptorily. A shuffling, meek-looking man, past middle-aged, stepped forward timidly. Carney, sir, he said deferentially. Now, Carney, tell just what happened from the time you got the call until you saw the young man die. Well, it was this way. The captain told me a gent up in room 16 wanted a menu and would have luncheon served in his room for himself and wife. I took the service elevator and came up. The man, Mr. Anson, was the only person I saw in the room. He was in his shirt sleeves, with his cuffs rolled back, as if he had been washing up. He was standing at the dresser when I came in. He'd just yelled, Come in! And I did. He told me he wanted luncheon for two right away. I gave him a pad to write his order on, and he studied the menu a while, and then he wrote what they wanted. He ordered a minute steak, French fried potatoes, French peas, tomato and lettuce salad, a chicken salad, half a grapefruit, and said be sure to put a maraschino cherry in the grapefruit as his wife liked him, a pot of coffee for two, and French pastry for both. Toasted rolls, too, I, I, I forgot to say. "'Ordered like a gentleman, sir, as if he knew good food. "'He give me fifty cents to hurry it up, "'and I took his order and left. "'How long did you take?' the sergeant asked. "'Plainly the laborous, slow voice of the waiter got on his nerves. "'Are you sure there was nobody else in the room?' "'About twenty minutes it took, sir. "'I didn't see anybody else in the room, "'but the lady might have been in the bathroom.' but he didn't consult her about the order. I wondered at the time if she had already told him what she wanted. Oh, yes, the water was running in the bathroom. I forgot to tell you that. I could tell by the sound that somebody was running a bath. Yes, go on, the sergeant cut in. Well, sir, I come up with my load on the service elevators, down at the other end of the corridor from the passenger elevators. I took my folding table and the tray into the room and set up the table. When I opened the door, he called out, Here's the luncheon, dear. Hurry and let's eat while it's hot. I suppose he was talking to his wife, but I didn't hear her answer him. I finished setting the table, and he told me to come back for the things in about an hour, and I left. The waiter paused for the sergeant was scanning the table with considerable interest. Flournoy stepped to his side, and the two talked in a low tone. I was just behind the house detective, so I heard what they said. Apparently ate with a good appetite, the sergeant said. Nearly all of the steak is gone, only two halves of rolls left, and a few spears of potato. Of course, that was the man's lunch. The lady must have liked her chicken salad. It's nearly all gone. Grapefruit, too. Hello. The French pastry is hardly touched. Either piece. What do you make of that? And he turned to Flournoy. I'd hate to say it reflects on the French pastry, Flournoy said, rather nettled. 
I should think it means that the two quarreled during the meal and that their quarrel had made them lose their appetites. Did you notice the coffee? The sergeant tilted the cup at what he had decided was the man's place. A heavy residue of sugar remained. Then he did the same to the woman's cup. No sugar in the woman's cup, he said. The man must have had a sweet tooth. See, he ate more of his chocolate eclair than the lady did. About the only clue to the lady's identity so far is that she didn't take sugar in her coffee, he grinned. Well, Carney, said the sergeant, turning to the waiter again. You came back for the dishes in an hour? An hour and ten minutes, sir. I was busy in another suite and the time went over just a mite. This room, as you know, is nearer the service elevators than it is the passenger lift. Well, I had just stepped out of the service elevator when I saw the door of room 16 open, and Mr. Anson staggered a step or two down the hall. He fell almost at my feet. He didn't speak a word, just fell. He walked like he had been pushed out of the room and couldn't get his balance again. The elevator starter saw him, too. He ran out of his car and we lifted the poor young man up. But we could see he was dead. We carried him into the room and put him on the bed. Did you see anybody in the room? No, sir. We looked about as soon as we had put him down, but there was nobody there, sir, or in the bathroom. We looked in the closets, too, thinking she might have hidden. I noticed the window was open, and I don't believe it was open when I was there first. Which window? The sergeant's excitement showed in his voice. That one that's open now, sir. It opens right on the fire escape, sir. I looked out of the window and down the fire escape, but I didn't see anybody climbing down. Do you think of anything else that might throw any light at all on this mystery, Carney? The sergeant's voice had a note of respect, for the meek waiter had made a good witness and had showed common sense immediately after the death of the boy. Nothing at all, sir, that I can think of now. But I'm still a bit dazed. If I think of anything else at all, sir, I'll tell you quick enough. I told you to have everybody here that could know anything about this thing. The sergeant turned to the house detective. Are the elevator boys here? All the boys who were running either service cars or passenger cars at the time are here, Mr. Marshall, Flournoy answered, a little truculently, I thought. It was evident that he resented the sergeant's manner. But an examination of the five or six boys brought out next to nothing. All passengers during those hours were pretty well accounted for, with one exception. A blonde woman of about thirty, looking like a motion picture actress in her heavy makeup, had got out of one of the cars at about twelve o'clock. The boy remembered the time, for it was his last trip in the car before going to his lunch. He had noticed her particularly, for he was a movie fan and always took more interest in passengers that might be picture people. But he didn't recognize the blonde painted woman. She went down the corridor, but in the opposite direction from room 16. He was sure of that, because he had watched her while he was holding the car for old Mrs. Peoples, who was half crippled and had to walk very slowly. He had never seen her in the hotel before, but then he had just been transferred from the service lift to the passenger elevator, and wouldn't have seen her if she had been there dozens of times before. Flournoy, when questioned, said he did not recognize the woman from the boy's description, and the possible clue seemed to be lost in a blind alley. The significant thing about it, however, was that none of the boys remembered having taken her down. While the sergeant was fruitlessly interrogating the previous witnesses all over again, in the hope of turning up something else, I strolled about the room. The reporters from the other papers were grouped together near the open window, apparently doping out the case to their own satisfaction. There is nothing a reporter enjoys more than building up fine and often intricate and ridiculous theories to explain even the simplest case. In fact, they are paid to keep up the public's interest with such mysteries as long as possible. I paused at the dresser. The man's military brushes and a small pocket comb lay there. Also, a can of scentless talcum, 
and a small bottle of fluid for keeping the hair in place, the usual impedimenta of the average American young man. The military brushes were of rather cheap quality, but the German silver plates on their backs were monogrammed with many flourishes, J.A. Either Jerry Anson was his real name, or he had fitted his alias to his own initials, a common enough habit in those who for any reason take assumed names. On the dressing table were evidences of the wife's occupancy, if indeed she was his wife. A box of perfumed face powder, a variety that sells for a dollar a box, was open, and grains of the powder had been spilled on the glass top of the dressing table. A somewhat soiled wool powder puff, backed with pink satin and a bit of fluffy white fur as a pom-pom, was crushed into the box of powder of a shade used only by olive-skinned women. Beside the powder lay a lipstick, a very dark red. The gold cap had been removed, showing that the lipstick had been used in that room. There was no rouge box, but I was reminded of the fact that many olive-skinned women do not use rouge on their cheeks, depending only on the scarlet of their lips for vividness. On the other side of the dressing table lay a comb and brush and hand mirror of ordinary white ivory, marked on the back with a hand-painted design of blue forget-me-nots. The comb was almost clean. If hair had been combed with it that day, then the hair had been very clean and free from oil. But in the brush there was caught a hair or two, hairs of a reddish-brown color. I strolled up to the sergeant, who was talking with Flournoy, the house detective. The woman you want is not a blonde, I said. She's brunette, with reddish-brown hair, slightly curly. She does not rouge her cheeks, which are olive-tinted. And she does use a dark red lipstick, probably very heavily. Her hair has just been shampooed. The sergeant was staring at me as if I were a seeress. "'Who in the world are you, and how do you know so much?' he demanded. "'Miss Austin of the press,' Flournoy chuckled as he introduced us. The sergeant followed me to the dressing table, where I went over my findings. He seemed to be entirely convinced of their soundness, and immediately detailed two plainclothes men to make inquiries for such a person as I had described, both in the hotel and in the principal shops.' for it was not forgotten that Mrs. Anson was supposed to be shopping while her husband was getting the room at the Alexandria. Would you mind telling me what you found in the man's pockets and luggage that would give me any clues to his personality or identity? I asked the sergeant. I was not here when you made the search. Certainly, he replied. He stopped to open the handsome black cowhide suitcase at his feet. Here's everything that was found. Suit of lavender silk pajamas, brand new, never been slept in. A white silk shirt, not badly worn, but still, it's seen its best days. Two white, near linen handkerchiefs, unmarked, even by a laundry. A pair of black silk socks with holes in the toes. If he had a wife, she didn't mend his socks, that's a cinch. That's all there was in the suitcase. In his pockets we found no money, just a small change purse, entirely empty. This little red book that's supposed to be a guide to Los Angeles streets and public buildings, and a yellow lead pencil. I looked at the stuff with keen interest, but its meagerness and commonplaceness discouraged my detective instincts. The patent conclusion, which had already been reached by Flournoy and the sergeant, as they told me quickly enough, was that the young man had intended to stay only one night in the Alexandria, and that, unless he had some hidden source of money, had intended to beat his hotel bill. Maybe his wife carried the purse, I suggested. That may be the reason he was so distressed over her long shopping orgy. Had it occurred to you that there are no women's garments in this suitcase? Doesn't that indicate that she wasn't his wife at all, that she met him here only for an amorous adventure? I realized too late that the other reporters, three of whom were still lingering, were absorbing my conclusions and would undoubtedly use them and add to them as their own. 
but only one of them worked on an evening newspaper, and he was of the aggressive kind that scorns other people's opinions. If he used mine, it would only be to refute them, and I needed all the meat I could get for the story I would have to hurry back to the office for the final edition. Then if the boy was having an adventure, he was pretty poorly provided with the wherewithal, and Flournoy grinned. Maybe that's what they quarreled about. He admitted to her over the French pastry and coffee that he was broke, and she reproached him, and he ended it all. I think it was suicide, he concluded. Then where is the container for the poison, I demanded. The policeman had been searching both bedroom and bath for the box or any other sort of container, but without results. Flournoy had also had the ground beneath the window thoroughly gone over. I neglected to mention that the room was a rear one, and that the fire escape led down into a rear court or areaway. A box hurled from the window just before the fatal dose had been taken would easily have been recovered, but there was no such box. Dr. Braddock, the house physician, had accompanied the body to the morgue, but the police had already gotten his verdict death by cyanide poisoning. Of course, a post-mortem would be held, but its results would not become public before the next day, or even for two days. I spent a few more minutes in studying the lay of the luncheon table, which had not been touched or disturbed in any way, and then I telephoned my paper from the room, the facts as far as I knew them at the time. The city editor had already sent our staff photographer to the morgue to photograph the young man, and his picture appeared in the final edition, which reached the streets around six o'clock. When I went to the office, I elaborated the story in my own style, creating a picture of the sought-for woman and describing with minute care the looks of the man, the room, and the examination of the witnesses. Then, in our usual sensational style, I queried the public. 1. Who is Jerry Anson? 2. Who was the olive-skinned, curly-haired woman who ate lunch with him and then fled when Jerry Anson was dying of cyanide poisoning? 3. Was Jerry Anson murdered by the woman who fled down the fire escape, or was he a suicide? 4. Did the woman flee because she was not his wife and could not risk exposure and scandal? I predicted that an analysis of the food on the table would show that the cyanide had been taken in the cup of coffee which had been less than half finished when Jerry Anson staggered from the table to die before he could summon help. That was another point which I stressed in my murder theory. If Jerry Anson had been determined to commit suicide, why did he stagger out of his room to seek help from the elevator man? The fact that he had left his room instead of looking toward the woman for help indicated to me that she had either left the room before he drank the deadly coffee or he knew her to be his murderess. I also reminded my readers of the old adage that no one commits suicide on a full stomach. There was something so heartening about good hot food that trouble seemed to lift, if only for an hour. Of course, the authorities had immediately notified Oakland of the death of Jerry Anson, and a wire to our staff correspondent there brought a long reply by wire. Although it was after nine o'clock when the answer came, I was telephoned for at my home. On my arrival, I was shown the wire and given a hurry-up assignment. Mrs. Amelia Anson, Jerry's mother, had been located by our reporter. Before she succumbed to grief prostration, she denied most emphatically that he was married or had been engaged to be married, so far as she knew. She said that he had left Oakland two days before his death, intending to find work, and had gone to the home of his cousins, Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Lord, of Long Beach. She had had a letter from him written the day before his death, and received just a few hours before our reporter broke the news of his death to her. The letter was optimistic. He said he was having a good time at his cousin's house, told how much he admired his second cousin, 16-year-old Alfreda Lord, and said he hoped to land a good job the next day. The letter ended with a request for a small loan of $20 to tide him over his job hunt. The mother tearfully protested that her boy was a thoroughly good son, but he had been unfortunate in the matter of jobs. 
She had immediately dispatched a letter with the money order for thirty dollars, more than he had asked for. She also protested that he would not commit suicide because he was broke. He knew she would always send him something, all she could afford. I want you to hustle out to Long Beach and see this girl, uh, afraid of Lord, before the police get on the track of these cousins he was visiting, the Night City editor told me. I had no trouble in locating the Lords, for our Oakland correspondent had given the correct address. I found the household in a state of terrific excitement. Not only had they read my sensational account of the Anson boy's death, together with its description of the woman whose personal appearance I had built up from her cosmetics, but their daughter was missing. I sensed immediately their dreadful fear of me and guessed its cause, even before I saw a portrait of the young girl hanging on the wall of the stuffy little sitting room. She had lovely curly hair, and her great lustrous brown eyes indicated an olive complexion. "'Have you any idea where your daughter is?' I asked." She, she's at the home of a girlfriend. She told us she was going to spend the night there, the mother offered tremblingly, looking toward her haggard-faced, silent husband. Mother, we've got to find Alfreda. There's no use beating about the bush, the husband said suddenly. She can explain where she's been. Then to me, we've called up her girlfriend's house, and she hasn't been there all day. Did she or Jerry leave the house first? I asked. She did, her mother answered, crying freely now. Oh, this is terrible. Was Jerry in love with Alfreda? I probed relentlessly. He, he hardly knew her, the father said slowly. He was here a lot last summer, but Alfreda was nearly always out with the other youngsters. I think he admired her a lot. He was always telling her how pretty she is. But I know she didn't give him a thought. The man's careful reply told me that I had hit upon a sore spot. Evidently, the mother and father knew that Jerry Anson had been crazy about the girl. This was the basis of their wild fears now. I was about to leave the house when I asked suddenly if I might see the girl's room. They consented, exchanging fearful glances. The walls of the little room were almost covered with pictures of movie stars, mostly of the sleek-haired chic type. The little white dresser was almost bare, but in the middle stood what I had been looking for, a small white ivory tray decorated with blue forget-me-nots. This is very pretty. Did your daughter paint it? I asked. Yes, both father and mother answered immediately with a touch of pride. Where is the rest of the set? I asked. I'd like to see the other pieces. The mother opened a bureau drawer and then looked blankly at me. The other pieces were gone. Without increasing their terror by telling them what I thought, I took my leave. I was sure the city editor would want to get out an extra on the facts I had obtained, and I was in a hurry to get to a telephone. As I was walking rapidly down the path, I almost stumbled against a figure crouching beneath a small palm tree. Even before I raised her to her feet, I knew who it was. Alfreda Lord had come home to face the music, whatever the tune might be. I went with her into the house and heard her tearful yet defiant rebuttal of her parents' frantic accusations. When her mother told her that they had called the girlfriend and had found that Alfreda had not been at her home, she hesitated, then told them her story. Her story was pitifully weak. She said she had gone to the beach for a swim, had rented a bathing suit, and stayed in the water until nearly lunchtime. She had gone into Los Angeles for lunch at the Pig and Whistle alone, and had then gone to a movie at the Kinema Theater. After dinner, still alone, she had gone to another movie at the Mission Theater and had then taken the trolley to Long Beach. Alone? All that time? I inquired skeptically. Yes. I wanted Pearl to go with me, but she had a date, so I decided to spend one day just as I pleased. 
Where did you get the money for your lonesome party? I prodded her. I made it myself, she protested. I worked as an extra for three days last week over on the new art lot. The next day the girl was arrested, charged with the murder of Jerry Anson. The presence of her comb and brush and mirror, together with her favorite brand of face powder and lipstick, seemed sufficient evidence for the grand jury then in session. Her alibi had been completely exploded before Jerry Anson had been dead twenty-four hours. It looked very black indeed for pretty little Alfreda Lord. I interviewed her twice, trying to wring a confession from her, or at least an honest story of her luncheon with Jerry Anson. But she stoutly, sullenly, and defiantly asserted her innocence of any connection at all with his death. She said she had not seen him since his last breakfast at her home. When I reminded her that her own alibi had been ripped to ribbons, she shut up and refused to answer any more questions. Chemical analysis of the food left on the luncheon table revealed the presence of cyanide only in the cup of coffee from which the boy had drunk. At the order of the district attorney, the luncheon table had been left exactly as it was when the death was discovered, with the exception of the removal of portions of food. Two or three detectives had gone over everything thoroughly, but still Room 16 remained just as Jerry Anson had left it, and would remain so until every possible clue had been exhausted. Although the girl had been arrested, a case had to be built up against her, and the room itself offered the only possible source for clues, it seemed. Could the girl be guilty? An hour after the lusty lung newsboys had begun to screen their gruesome invitation to read about the Anson murder mystery, I was still at my desk lost in a brown study. Some loose end kept hammering at my brain, demanding to be cleared up. And suddenly I saw daylight. I grabbed my telephone. A long minute later I was talking to the chief of detectives. Have you had a report from the fingerprint experts yet? I demanded. They're working on them now, the chief answered. They've taken the prints from nearly everything in the room, especially the dishes and silver, I insisted. Sure, the chief came back. Hold the line and I'll see when they expect to be finished. A little later came the good news. Be ready to show them to you in less than half an hour. A taxi took me quickly to the hotel, which had settled down to normal. Flournoy, the house detective, seemed glad to see me. Well, have we found the mystery girl, Miss Detective? he asked teasingly. No, and yes, I replied, for I don't believe there was one. Flournoy looked at me inquiringly, about to ask a question, but I hurried him on up to room 16. "'What do you mean about the woman?' Flournoy asked, entering the room directly behind me. "'Just what I said. There was no lady. Jerry Anson was here alone. He committed suicide, did it to get even with the girl who had turned him down. I'll bet my life. Alfreda Lord. Wanted to go out in a blaze of publicity and to cause as much trouble and excitement as he could. He stole Alfreda's toilet set and planted it in the room. Probably thought Alfreda could prove an alibi, but wanted to get even with her and cause her a lot of trouble anyway. And what about the lunch she ate? We know from the post-mortem he didn't eat it. She didn't eat it either. Instead, he threw it away. Washed it away, rather. Flournoy looked at me a moment, then started toward the bathroom. "'What about the container for the cyanide?' he asked. "'That, too. And what's more, I'll be willing to bet a week's pay you will find traces of mayonnaise, a slight film of grease left behind from the salad in there, to prove my point.' Flournoy returned from the bathroom a minute later, smiling broadly. "'You're right,' he said. "'Whatever started you on this track?' Well, I admitted, there was one little clue that struck me as significant all along. The girl was supposed to have used a lipstick just before the luncheon, but one of the first things I noticed was that there was no little line of red on the grapefruit spoon, and there always is on my spoon. The darn stuff just will come off. All my surmises proved to be entirely correct, and the fingerprints found on the china proved definitely that no one had been in the room except Jerry Anson. 
Alfreda had refused Jerry's proposal of marriage the night before he died, so she told us later. He was not the first love-smitten swain to seek solace in death. End of The Mystery of Room 16 by Anne Austen